This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. Hey, this is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life, a show where I talk with some of the most creative musicians, writers, artists, designers, entrepreneurs, and academics. And in this episode, I'm going to be talking to Rolf Kent, a wonderful uh, composer for TV and film. And we're going to be covering things like composition and how it's actually a juxtaposition, about the idea of overwork as a creative, morning pages, and being paid to do fun work. So let's get into the show. Hi, it's James Taylor here, and I'm delighted today to have Rolf Kent. Rolf is a Los Angeles-based film composer who has scored more than 50 films, including Academy Award-nominated Up in the Air, Sideways, About Schmidt, Legally Blonde, Wedding Crashes, and the main title theme for the TV show Dexter. Born in England into a non-musical family, he knew at age 12 that he wanted to be a film composer. One of his latest projects is The Zen Effect, an innovative album of ambient drones for healing, meditation, and enhanced concentration. So, Rolf, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you. So, share with our listeners, what's going on in your world just now? Um, What's going on in the world is uh, I'm developing a piece of interactive theatre, and and I'm also working on the Zen Effect. And right now I'm just waiting for one more, uh, one film to get to a point where it's uh, time to start talking about music. So... um, so I'm in I'm, I'm in sort of uh, pre-work limbo on the film, right in the middle of the Zen effect and right in the middle of the theatre piece. And how did you get started in specifically in terms of film composition? Because I believe you you actually majored in philosophy at first. Psychology. Psychology. Psychology, psychology is what I got. Um, but um, yeah, I uh, so how did I get started? Well, actually, it was, it's um, I always wanted to be uh, a film composer. I'd, I'd wanted that for a while, but the um, uh, but I didn't I, I didn't think it was particularly realistic, especially with uh, no particular training. Um, but I, I would always talk about it, and, and, uh, and I was actually at university when a friend of mine um, who was writing a theatre piece. Uh, for the uh, university theatre group uh, asked me to write the music for it, knowing that I wanted to become a film composer. And that theatre piece did very well, went to Edinburgh Festival, and uh, that friend became a professional writer, and he got me an introduction to just an industrial training video company. And so the first actual scoring job I ever did was uh, for uh, an industrial training video. It was uh, had a great cast, oddly. I, it seems like uh, you, in, you can get amazing actors um, for a, a, on a day rate, even for <laughs> sort of uh, training videos. But uh, it was a sort of spy, it was a sort of thriller piece, but, you know, subliminally teaching um, sales technique. That's, what, that, that's okay. where I began. And so uh, I'm imagining those are things people don't put on their IMDb uh, you know, they're, they're, they they don't, don't put on the CVs too often. I, I don't. I, well, it's, it's not public. It's a private. You know, I mean, it's a it's a training thing. So yeah. it wouldn't it wouldn't mean anything to put it on IMDb. So I don't know if they'd even take it. Um, and I don't know the name of it now. Anyway, I, it's so long ago. So you went from from your this kind of industrial training video, and then what was what was the move then into uh, into film and TV composition? Um, well, I mean, to, to be honest, I've just done one rung of the ladder at a time. So, uh, industrial videos, uh, lots of student films, lots of student films. So, so I, I was in London. I go to parties that uh, film students were going to, and um, and I try and persuade them to let me record the music to their uh, their next short film. And uh, so that was the second rung on the ladder. And was that was, and, that, was that an easy sell uh, when you were speaking to the, these young uh, either direct, directors or you, writers? You know, now I, 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 it, it actually wasn't too hard, which, which amazed me. I can't think that it's that easy anymore. But um, at the time, people were sort of uh, happy and bemused to be approached. So they go, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> so... 
So I ended up um, doing a bunch of uh, music to student films. And that meant, you know, I'd, I'd actually got a bit of a resume. You know, I actually had music I had written with my name on it to uh, on, on these short things. And, um, and then one of them, uh, one filmmaker made a short film and I did the music to it. And then he got picked up to uh, become part of a production company which had offices in London and in Los Angeles. And he... Um, when they and, they and that particular company in Los Angeles was looking for an in-house composer for one particular set of short films that they were producing, and um, and they liked the music well just on the strength of one film, just on the strength of the music to that one short film. They uh, they hired me to uh, go to Los Angeles and um, do some work, and uh, and and of course I ended up doing thirty seven short films with twelve new directors, all of whom had f uh, feature aspirations. So I was suddenly you know really pretty impressively connected to people who were later to have a feature career. So is that unusual then, where um, you were in learning your craft, you got so much, uh, I, I mean, if, if you were in Silicon Valley, that, that would be kind of called deal flow. You, 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 but you had an op opportunity to work on lots of things very quickly and, uh, you know, just start developing your craft. Is, is, is that usual? Is that what, you know, young um, uh, film composers do? Or do they have to, uh, other, is the work much more kind of spaced out? I'm fascinated by deal flow. I've never even heard that term, and I, and I, I want to know more <laughs> about it. Um, but uh, I think I was extraordinarily lucky. I, you know, the idea that that would just land and that one production entity would, would give me so many powerful connections, uh, that I think is pretty unusual. I mean, I don't think the world of uh, feature films anyway and television is set up that way. It seems to my, you know, we, it's... It, there's no huge meeting place where everyone gets to see everything that's going on. So it's, it's very much a cottage industry. So it's very hard to have an overall perspective. But my perspective is it's very pyramidal that, uh, you know, if there are certain key composers who have most of the television work and certain key composers who seem to do uh, just films. And there isn't a lot of crossover. And um, I think... I, I, the, the way of people getting into the industry now, just um, it seems very um, diffuse. I, I'm not quite sure if there's any particular path I would recommend. The only path I wouldn't recommend is the one which seems to be very popular, which is to ghostwrite for uh, um, uh, established composers. And the reason I wouldn't recommend that is because uh, you end up with no credits um, no verifiable music that you wrote, um, and consequently, um, you, you're kind of still no, nowhere. And I, I don't see a lot of people succeeding by going down the ghostwriting route. And is is the the you know, when you're talking about a film, which are you know big budgets? Actually, I suppose now you know TV. A lot of the TV shows are, are huge budgets as well. But with film, is part of that thing where um, there's a small number of people who get all the work simply because the people that are putting the money into this and the and the producers want a safe pair of hands. I think so. I think so. I mean, I, I think the same thing applies for why. Uh, so much uh, typecasting, both in actors and in you know, all sorts of creatives in, in the film industry. Why, you know, once you get known for one thing, it's very hard to break out and to become you know known for for a second thing. And it's because, well, they trust you with that thing, but they don't. They, you yeah. know, it's it's all about trust, isn't it? And uh, and and about money. And they just go, well, we we know he can deliver that kind of music. So why would we offer him this kind of film? That's different. Uh, so that's why I think it becomes very hard to um, be fluid and, and uh, mobile within within the industry. And, and when you're given uh, a piece of work to do, let's say if it's it's a film and you're working directly, let's say with the the director, where you know talk, talk us through the actual kind of creative process for you as the as the film composer. How much is the is the director or the Right, all the people involved in film coming to you with specific ideas of specific things that they want within it, even if they're maybe talking about it in terms of visual as opposed to auditory ways. Um, and at which point, uh, how much do you have a bit of a uh, a blank slate from which to work on, and uh, how how do things develop? 
Yeah, that's for, it, well, it varies considerably. I mean, of course, one of the one of the great things about working in film is that you never have the blank page. I mean, you sort of have a blank page, but you, in in that, you know, if you're a writer coming up with your first novel or seventh novel, you know, you do, you know, you genuinely have a blank page. And with a film, you've just got something to bounce the ideas off. So you're, uh, you're, you're, you're always writing to picture. Always writing, yeah. They always go, and if not, you know, I mean, and yeah, exactly. You've always got it's got it's going to work with the picture sooner or later. So you can always use the film as the point of inspiration. Is, is, so, it, is it true that you know, there's? Uh, I imagine there's very few of this that happens. If if this is even true at all, that with someone like Morricone, um, where the editor edits to his music, which is the complete opposite way around. Yeah, well, that, that happens a certain amount, and, and very occasionally, uh, you know, one gets asked to write music bef- while they're shooting or before they shoot, so that they have a, you know, so if the, but that's a very specific thing, and that's generally because of a very sp- specific directorial, you know, choice. Okay. The director really wants has a relationship with a composer and really wants to try something. Um, normally, that doesn't happen, um, but uh, but during the edit, it happens uh, a lot. Um, uh, when I say a lot, more than one might expect. The um, because now it, nowadays we seem to get involved in writing the music way before the edit is complete. Whereas it used to be that you'd you'd wait more or less until it was finished. Whereas now you can send them music and uh, and they will try something out and then they might change the the picture according to the image. And I had a very surprising experience last year. I was working on an animation called Rock Dog, which comes out later this year. And um, I'd written this, this you know, the, 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 the one particular sequence, it had this melody, and then it transitioned. And they said, ah, oh, it's a pity the melody doesn't transition, you know, f- three seconds earlier on that cut. And I said, well, sure, I can do that. So I did it. And, but it meant clipping the melody short a little bit. And the next time... We looked at it. They go, ah, oh, it's a pity we don't get the full melody. <laughs> I just jokingly said, well, just throw in three more seconds. And um, because it's animation, they could generate three more seconds of film. Yeah. And they did, and <laughs> to my amazement. So the, uh, the film, that, that little sequence got extended by a few seconds in order to accommodate the melody, which <laughs> I have wow. to say blew my mind i mean that, that you know the you know, i'm at the bottom of the totem pole you know music is uh, there to fix the problems it's not to ge- not there to generate the problems so uh, the uh, the idea that they would actually modify the picture to uh, around the music was uh, quite you, surprising to you me you just at the start of that the, the usual way is the, the directors come you you you're you're writing to picture talk us through that that kind of creative process for you then right well so i mean the the, the simple logistics are you have a film, you sit down with the director, the director goes through, you and the director go through the entire film spotting, which means looking for the spots which need music and discussing each time, discussing why it needs music, what that music is supposed to do, what the energy is, what the emotion is, what the audience should feel. And you take notes, take lots and lots of notes. And then the director goes away, you sit down uh, and you write music. And you write music based around those notes, the director's aspirations for the film, and the you know, and the energies and the emotions and the and the narrative, and uh, and then you know frequently, uh, my directors come in and uh, watch what I've done and give me some direction. You know, I don't like this, but I do like that. Um, this needs to turn change earlier. You know, all that kind of stuff. Mm. So those are the broad sweeps. And then, you know, after a couple of months, hopefully more or less got to the end and you can then go and record an orchestra or whatever instruments are involved. And, and the role of the, um, the sound designer as well within this. Uh, so how does so on, on some things where you're maybe which are less um, less kind of traditional pieces of music and more moods and feels. Uh, does that does that require a different way of of thinking about about the music, or is it? Are you really just kind of going in with your kind of toolkit and then just picking what's going to work for that? I, I don't think it's a different uh, set of tools. I, I I mean, I'm very aware that there are very few memorable um, melodic scores these days. There are an awful lot more of things which have a lot of sound design, or they're simply using orchestra as sound design, and um, and that's you know, become very, very common. Um, 
that it's pretty much the same toolkit. The the thing that's missing, of course, is is great original thought. A lot of the time, I mean, you know, it's it's one thing to come up with interesting textures, but it's another thing to actually author an original idea. And so, you know, when you mentioned Ennio Morricone. There's a man who is incapable of not having an original idea. He is, you know, he is melodic. He is, uh, you know, he has signature style. And um, so there's, a, you know, there's intense authorship in someone like Ennio Morricone's music, which I think is lacking in the vast majority of film music today. Um, there's a, but that's not to say it's wrong. It's actually, you know, it's complete. It's often completely appropriate to the kind of films that are being made. It's I, I just miss it because I think there's something interesting to be said as a composer, and 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 unfortunately these. Um, films are not are not uh, benefiting from that, but they're benefiting from something different. Um, but I think it's the same toolkit. Um, there are sound designers, um, but they, uh, they they don't normally let us in the same room. <laughs> Is that, is that for emotional reasons, if nothing else? <laughs> I don't know. I actually think it's just. In, I, I think. I think. I, I'm not quite sure why it works this way, but we're both working uh, on our own up to the final mix of the film. So the sound design people are just, and they've got, they actually have to provide a lot of different options because when the mix happens, there's often a director there sitting through the entire thing, going, "I don't like that door slam. Show me another one." No, I don't like that one. Show me another one. So they, they, they have to have tons of things, of options. Mm. Whereas uh, as a composer, you, know, you hope to have narrowed those options down to one by the time you get to the mix. And in this, in this journey that you've had as well, can you maybe talk to us, you don't have to necessarily mention specific uh, films or directors, but tell us about a time when you've worked on a project, you've given it your heart and your soul, but for whatever reason, it hasn't worked out like you'd hoped. And more importantly, what were the, the lessons that you took away from that experience? Well, to be honest, I mean, because it's so – because I, I, I choose to work so collaboratively. So I keep the director so involved in the process. So there's no point at which, you know, it fails because, you know, you, you keep on working until you get to a place where the director is satisfied. Now – that doesn't mean to say that it always feels great. Um, I mean, there's certainly been uh, one or two films where I, by the end of the process, I just didn't think I'd written, I, I didn't think I'd found the heart of the, of the film. Um, but, that's, but the director was thrilled. The director was very happy with what uh, they had. But, the, but I just felt like, I don't know what this score is. I don't know where the heart center of it is. So, but that's only happened once or twice. And if there's a lesson to take from that, it's that it doesn't really matter. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the, in terms of, I mean, what are the priorities? Uh, the priority, the, the, you know, the commercial priority is, you know, you need to satisfy the client. You know, you need to provide the director and the film, you know, production company with what they need. Uh, the second on the hierarchy of needs seems to me to make myself very happy. Um, and sometimes I make that the first thing, and um, uh, which is, you know, to really produce something that I feel, you know, expresses expresses something that I wanted to express and um, has some heart and soul, or at least I feel it has some heart and soul to it. And have you ever been in situations where perhaps you and the director have had a very strong view about what you, what the music has to be and, and you kind of deliver something, but folks either at the, um, the studio or production company, the other people around it, uh, say, no, this, this has, has to go. How, how does that relationship work? Well, normally that's taken care of really just between me and the director. So there have definitely been times when I've written a piece of music, I feel like it absolutely sort of nails something. It, it works with the picture, it's got an emotion, it's got a power, and the director comes in and says no. Um, well, that, there are two, you know, the first, the first thing that happens is um, I encourage the director to take another look at it just in case it's offering something other than the director was really expecting but perhaps better. Hmm. I mean, you know, the, the it's an organic filmmaking is an organic process. It's um, you, you, and uh, there are lots of people contributing all the way along the line. And my favourite directors are ones who are open to those contributions, and may have uh, so they're not 
intensely linear about it. They, they're open to hearing something that they weren't expecting, which may improve their film in a, in a way they, they didn't know, know about. So the first thing is to you know, make sure that we really haven't thrown out something that was really good. Um, and if it's absolutely clear that it's not doing what the director wanted. And the fact is that director has a much broader perspective. They're, they're thinking about the entire narrative, whereas um, it's so easy to start getting all about this one scene. But suddenly, if you make this scene too intense, then it doesn't belong in the film anymore, or it doesn't work with the other scenes. So you've got to trust the director. So the next thing I do is throw the music out and start again. Now, uh, it's very occasionally, a director will just go, no, that piece of music completely doesn't work. However, try it over here. And so sometimes there are you know, great directors who will um, suggest repurposing an idea somewhere else in the film and they've just hit, you know, and hit gold. So there are some very creative directors with that, with that kind of perspective. But, um, but I, I have, you know, I have no problems at all about throwing my music out and uh, starting over. That's very much the job. So, and when they're giving you that feedback, is it, is it coming in the form of very strong kind of visual feedback? You know, this, this thing needs to happen quicker at this point here, this needs to happen. You know, there's, there's not enough, uh, blue in that that piece there and and you're having to translate that into musical terms or are you are you working with directors who maybe have a sense of um what is maybe going on in the music and, and not just what's kind of happening visually um but well a bit of both i mean the 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 worst thing to start out with is someone who is, wants to talk in terms of music that's um that's kind of a disaster that's interesting um, so, so i would have thought it'd be that, that that would have been a, a bonding experience but it's not um, no, it really isn't because <laughs> because it doesn't really mean anything. I mean, um, it's too often. I mean, so they love saxophone, yeah, but saxophone can do diabolical things. It can do fantastic things, you know. So what does that mean? Um, uh, you don't want to get too locked into um, uh, um, you know the musical, the imagined musical vocabulary of one particular person. You want to be locked into the narrative, the story, the energy, the emotion. Um, and then find your own way to express that. I mean, a great example was, uh, you know, I scored a film called Mean Girls, and the director um, is very, he's great, Mark Waters, wonderful director, very clear, um, and he knows all about the twists and turns and the emotions he wants. And I turn to him and say, do you mind if I do that with an African choir? And he, <laughs> he looks at me and goes, um... Well, if it works, okay. And that's it, you know, end of discussion. Mm. Um, it's, it's, you know, he wasn't locked into any particular sound or any particular version of what I was going to do. He wants the film to work. Well, he, he wants, wants, he the, wants story. the emotional and the, and the narrative to come through. Right, exactly. So I ended up using a South African choir and, um, and it was, you know, very satisfying experience for me and, um, and the film worked. So uh, it all worked out. And on, um, on, so on, that, on that particular case, were you doing, um, it, and I'm trying to remember the movie, the 2001 Space Odyssey, where, where, where they're purposely, and I don't know, actually may, this may or not be done on purpose, but the, the, the visuals are doing something different to the, the music. And maybe that's not a good example, but where you've seen maybe examples where there's a very fast, scene and suddenly they play some very lethargic slow sounding thing were, were right. you were you doing that on purpose just to make a bit of a disconnect uh which film are you talking about the, the one with the the uh, the african choir oh i see no 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 the, it was actually completely a connection the the the, the pre-story to the film was that this guy a lead character had been schooled in Africa, but was now in America. Okay. So I just thought, well, let's imbue the entire thing with an African flavor. Um, so that, um, because I thought that was an interesting point of, uh, of reference. So, um, but, but it's interesting when you talk about uh, those kinds of juxtapositions, there was, there was one great composer, and I forget which it was. It was someone like Jerry Goldsmith or Le Elmer Bernstein or someone who said, um, composition is juxtaposition. And, um, my, uh, I, I love it when the, the most important thing it seems to me is to contribute something which isn't already there. So, uh, you know, and, and again, so often films just seem to sort of like dial, 
dial the the volume up. They just go, okay, it's an action sequence. So what are we going to put on it? Action music. You just go, oh yeah. So you just manage to push it up to, you're trying to push it up to 11, but you're not really adding anything. Hmm. You're simply dialing it up. Whereas um, if you put on a serene ballet across the action sequence, now you've contributed something completely different. You've contributed something which wasn't already there. And if it makes narrative sense, if you've got, uh, you know, it's an action sequence, but it's tragic, you know, that, 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 but something awful is happening or someone's, you know, heart is breaking, but you can't really tell in the film because of the action. You can put it in the music and you can bring that sense of pathos, of tragedy, of sadness um, when it's not visually apparent. So, and quite often in films, uh, things are missing, that they were in the screenplay. You knew that this was going to feel this way, but somehow or other on the film, it doesn't. It doesn't have that feeling. So you turn to the music and you go, can you bring us that feeling? And um, so juxtaposition is you know, my favorite thing. And, um, and, it, and it's sometimes when it's requested and, you know, sometimes people know about it, but often it is, um, I call it invading the pitch. Do you know, you know, when, when you're watching a football match and at the end you just go, and the fans have invaded the pitch. Uh, does it happen more on football or cricket? I'm not sure, but um, cricket doesn't seem to me an invade the pitch kind of sport, but I'm, I'm, so I'm guessing it's soccer. <laughs> yeah, it probably is. But, um, the um, but it, I, and I call it invading the pitch because you've taken the thing and you start out just going, I, you know, it's already I, it it knows what it is. I should leave it alone. And then you go, wait a minute, <laughs> why am I in the room then? And you just go, okay, so invade the pitch, find a great idea which didn't exist before, and put it up against the image. And now what do you have? I mean, I think of. Um, if you think of, uh, I'm afraid I just go straight to Westerns, um, The Magnificent Seven, yeah. the opening sequence uh, is really slow. It is these horsemen coming very slowly down across a, a gentle uh, hillside. And the music is going, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, and it's blasting. And if you were to take the, you know, before he wrote the music, the film was just, <sighs> nothing was going on. Breaks the music, and you know you're in for an adventure. Um, if you think of the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know another Ennio Morricone score. I mean that. Uh, I can't whistle yeah, right now, yeah. but but that you know didn't exist, and then he made it exist, and suddenly you've got a very different film. Apparently, um, uh, Psycho was was uh, destined to be a B movie. No one thought it was any much good, and um, and then. Uh, uh, Bernard Herrmann wrote that um, you know iconic uh, shower scene music, and it's suddenly it's you know it's uh, something altogether heightened and uh, different. So, so how, how do you stay inspired for ideas? I mean, you hear about um, I can't remember the film composer that did the music for um, Ben Hur, who was also did a lot of classical work as well, and he would say he would go and write classical. Uh, kind of heavyweight classical stuff for six months and he'd come back and he would do the film stuff for six months and he said both fed off each other and they both got value from each other he was getting different ideas and and uh, and kind of seeding them in different ways so how where do you kind of go to stay kind of fresh stay inspired and maybe get new ideas um well a couple of things firstly i know i don't overwork it's, it's really important to me that I love my work. Um, I, I, um, and occasionally I get work back to back to back. And, um, and then I sort of start a project and I'm already exhausted. And it's like, oh God, another ton of music to write. I don't want to be that person and I don't want to be in that situation. So firstly, I try to stay fresh. So I don't overwork. I certainly don't work long days. Um, I work, you know, perfectly adequate days, but I, um, but I don't work into the night because it just burns me out mm. and it burns out my passion. So first thing is to, um, is to stay uh, inspired by the prospect of work. Um, and then um, uh, I very rarely listen to music. Um, I don't drive with music on the radio, um, but, uh, but when I'm looking for ideas or wanting to be inspired, um, I will absolutely. I listen to Radio Three. I will go to concerts. I will. 
Um, I, I find it, you know, if when my radar is on, I find it very easy to be inspired. I will hear the, the screech of a bus's brakes, and I will find that inspiring. Um, so uh, it, it's, it varies. But it's also, I mean, for anyone who's done the artist's way, you know, there are certain key things in that. Yeah, such Julie as, Cameron. You know, yeah, Great go book. to have an artist date every week or... Um, uh, you know, I, one of the things that I really learned from that was um, that I, I, you know, sit down to do the morning pages and have nothing to say. So you simply start writing about the most trivial, pathetic little idea, and we should discover that it wasn't a trivial and pathetic idea after all. It becomes something, and from that I took that you know sometimes when you're being creative, uh, taking uh, something really apropos of nothing, a little you know, I, I'm reminded of um, uh, Feynman. Richard, Richard, P, Richard P. Feynman, who uh, he was burned out and he decided to take a sabbatical. And then he saw a waiter spinning a plate uh, and decided to come up with a, a, um, a, a, an equation to describe the spinning of a plate. And that, just for fun, which, and that was the start of a project which ended up in him getting a Nobel Prize because he was inspired. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's key to sort of uh, find those little things that out of nowhere, which uh, for fun, you know, and, and, you know, I do it in work all the time. A friend of mine was complaining that uh, they were being required to do the same music they'd written before. And I said, no, 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 that's not the gig. The gig is to, do, to have fun experiments and be paid to do them. And that's, um, uh, and because you're going to still deliver what is required at the end of the day, but the experiment is going to make you full of excitement and energy and make it really great. I, I love that. I love the idea of you know, doing, uh, being paid to do <laughs> experiments. That's a really great, great way of thinking about it. And, you know, was one of these experiments, you, you, you did this thing, the Zen effect, um, which uh, a mutual thing friend, uh, Rolf Potts, the writer, uh, told me about and it sounded really interesting because you know there's there's great sites like focus at will and um different places of where you can kind of get music to help you focus or or for meditation or for different things so uh, talk to us how did the what is the zen effect um and how did it kind of well the zen about? effect is uh the the there are two albums at the moment and um and there's more coming and the uh, they generally All right. How did it come about? Yeah, for some reason the um, the audio was cracking up just then. Um, so, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Sure. Hello. Yep, I can hear you. Okay. Good. Yeah. Um, so uh, it started out with um, simply being at a uh, in a disco where the DJ had decided to play um, a drone, um, a, lot, a big sort of ambient om behind everything, and. Uh, and it was just, it, it blew my mind. It sounded amazing. So I, I got home and I created one myself. I created a 44 minute long track, which was really just subtling, uh, subtly shifting shades of G. And, um, and then I found myself on, uh, one day I was on the train going into London and it was a 20 minute journey. And I was just had, had this, this thing on my headphones as I uh, took the train. And I was uh, humming to myself and staring out the window and, um, and suddenly the train was slowing and I didn't understand why it would be slowing because it wasn't supposed to stop till it got to London and look at the window and we were already in London, but it seemed like it had been five minutes. So this, this complete shift in time perception uh, really astonished me. And um, so I kept on listening to this thing when I went into the underground and found that um, it, it felt like my own personal coiner squadsy. It felt like uh, instead of hassle, it felt like flow. It felt mm. like I was, I was, it was like a river. You know, it was watching tadpoles on a nature documentary. You were just simply flowing around the, uh, the the underground and onto the trains and stuff. It had a very different uh, flavor to it, and um, and I, and I, it's it's it still does. So at some point, I. Uh, played one of these uh, these long drones to um, Jason Reitman, the film director, and he just said, oh, you've got to release that. And I said, there's nothing there. It's just a drone. And he said, no, 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 you should release that. So I created a bunch of them and, um, and uh, 
put them out as the Zen effect. So each one is uh, their ambient tones or ambitones. So they're each one's one note is the center of it, but it's played by lots of different instruments, which are subtly handing over from each other to each other, so that it ends up being 30 minutes, which is one note, or it's actually a combination of notes, but it feels more or less like one note, but it feels very grounding, rather rich and warm and supportive, um, and it does certain things to the way you think. So um, that's what the uh, the Zen effect is. And, and what is, what's the response been from people that, that, that you can use the music in different, you know, for different uses? Um, and also, have you had any, um, any folks that may be involved in the kind of science of sound saying, actually, this is what's going on. This is, this is triggering this in the brain. Uh, well, yeah, I've, I've got two neuroscientists who were very interested in, and, uh, uh, we're hopefully going to do some fMRI scans in the near future. Um, I mean, I can guess at some of the things that are happening, but um, so the, the the responses to people of, of people um, people writers love it because um, it's a very supportive sound, and it doesn't unlike playing music in the background, which is often full of events um, th- that get in the way of your. F- train of thought it actually just opens your train of thought mm. and allows you to um uh to to take leaps which you might otherwise not have taken so that's um so writers seem to like it um i know a number of uh yoga people you uh, use it in their classes and um i know uh, hospice workers that uh, use it so uh it's finding a place it's finding a home in a, a lot of interesting places and um and i i um, i'm about to start um producing some simple meditation things the um you know meditation doesn't need any um support but some people just are freaked out by the idea of sitting in silence for you know 5 minutes let alone 20 minutes or an hour so um you know as training wheels for meditation i think it's uh, amazing because it, it, it as i say it does something there's um it, they report in um long-term meditators that the pcc the posterior cingulate cortex tends to deactivate in meditators and the pcc is very interesting it's to do with um you need it because you need to get motivated. You need to connect, be able to connect memories um, with emotions and things like that. But um, and it, uh, but when you deactivate it, it puts you into flow. It puts you into a state of effortless ease and unselfconscious um, uh, presence. So uh, it's very. You know, it's, you know, it's it's a tricky one because obviously you need to be motivated in order to get stuff done. But if you can turn it off, then you can enter a you know a place where creative flow is very simple, and um, and you don't have to uh, you're you're not always looking at yourself and judging yourself for what you're doing. You're just doing. So if you think of like when you're skiing or. Um, uh, or if you sort of uh, jump off the diving board into a pool or something, uh, or you know, so, something where you're simply easily exhilarated but not self-conscious, um, then uh, then that would quite likely be a, a place where the PCC is less active. So it's a very desirable state to achieve, especially if you're able to be very functional and yet effortless and um, uh, and relaxed. So these, the, and it seems, I mean, I, I can only say, you know, we haven't done any studies yet, but um, it seems very plausible to me that the Zen effect has, uh, the tracks have that kind of impact on the way you, um, our brains work. I mean, it's, fa- it's a fascinating area as well. I mean, I'm just thinking that all the different possible applications f- uh, for this as well. One, one that which seems the most obvious is on flights, <laughs> which are uh, when I, I find it really interesting. Um, uh, traveling recently around Europe and uh, being on British Airways, who usually play kind of radio, th- uh, radio three kind of classical style of music, hopefully not too kind of full on stuff. And then mm-hmm. I'll, I'll go into another airline that will remain nameless. Um, and they're playing kind of full-on techno stuff, and yeah. and you can see the 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 stress and the anxiety going up, in people because because this stuff's kind of feeding into it. 
Yeah, no, exactly. Um, and and I, you know, on, on my uh, on the Zen Effect website, there is um, uh, an account by a friend who used, you know, he talked about how it um, he used it on a flight and how what a, what a what a change it made to the way he felt. Um, you know, both making the journey feel shorter, but also much more relaxed. Um, so absolutely, um, it's it's fascinating um, how things can be. Um, uh, used in that way. I mean, and, and that reminds me, you know, I mean, you think of meditation music and, and, you know, massage music and all that. And there's often, you know, tinkling piano and flutes and stuff. And it's, you know, the, it's interesting. My, the, the part of the point of the Zen effect is there is none of that. Yeah. There is nothing in it. And, I, and on the one hand, you might go, well, that sounds really, really boring. And, you know, but on the other hand, it actually just leaves you room to be and room for your imagination or your sense of flow to emerge. And um, so that is, you know, I'm very pointed about keeping it almost event free so that it, because it's, it makes it a very, you know, it, it means you can apply it in different situations where, where music gets in the way. And if, if you could share um, an online resource or tool like a, Evernote or something that you that you find really useful for you, for yourself and perhaps the work that you do. What what would it be? Uh, well, there's a couple. Um, let's see. Uh, I certainly use Evernote, and Evernote um, uh, certainly until recently has been my go-to for um, keeping audio notes. So mm-hmm. you know, when I'm writing tunes, you know, I gen- I often do uh, a, a lot of creative thinking while walking. Um, so being able to hum straight into Evernote uh, has been really useful. And um, uh, when I'm writing words, writing lyrics, there's a, an app called B Rhymes. It's just the letter B dash rhymes, um, which is great uh, for. Um, uh, it's it's a great rhyming app, um, partly because a B rhyme, by their definition, is a rhyme which doesn't really rhyme, but it almost rhymes. So it spreads the uh, it, it keeps the um, the scope larger. Yeah. There's a, there's a new app for music called um, Music Memo, and uh, that's just astonishing. You hum into it, and it adds bass and drums, wow. um, not uh, and writes out the chords. Um, now it's not entirely accurate, but it's a it's incredible that it even figures out as much as it does. So um, I'm quite impressed with that. Uh, but I I think I'm going to be mostly sticking with Evernote um, because it uh, because it's cleaner because yeah. it just just records the thing you're uh, thinking about well that's great and if listeners if they go to uh, jamesdale.me and they type in rolf kent they'll be able to get links to all these as well um just so we finish up here rolf if you could recommend just one record and one book to our listeners what would they be one record um i well the book is is uh, a couple of great books but um i, I would recommend um the Art of Possibility by uh, Zander and Zander. Um, Benjamin Zander is a really um, impressive, uh, he's a conductor, but he's a wonderful public speaker. Re- there are TED Talks by Benjamin Zander. Um, there are documentaries about him. Um, uh, he, uh, he has wonderful turns of phrase um, and uh, uh, he's very quotable. And um, so The Art of Possibility is actually a book for management but it is it is really kind of inspiring and uh, inspiring in creative ways. So I'd recommend that um, record. Do you mean like a, a, a CD or an LP or something? I'm, I'm going to I'm going to say album. <laughs> an album. Um, God, I, um, I I don't even know where to start. We, we, um, I mean, I, I know musicians they always struggle with this this question, um, and so the way that I'll, I'll sometimes ask this as well is. Is there a record that you've gifted more often? Mm, interesting. <laughs> you know, to my, uh, I'll tell you my two favorite albums, the Z Christmas album, which is bound to be way out of print from, used to be ZE Records, um, uh, fun, with, just a fun Christmas uh, uh, record, um, but it had some cool things on it. Um, and um, since you mentioned uh, Ennio Morricone earlier, um, I, I've, I'm hard pressed to find a single composer that doesn't think the score to the mission is the finest score there is. Um, It is, it is simply a a spectacular piece of work um, and um, and really memorable and uh, tune filled and layered. It's spectacular. 
Awesome. And we'll put all the links to these on jamestaylor.me. People can go there. So just as we finish up, last question. Imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and had to start from scratch. So that you've got the tools of your trade, which I'm assuming is your your computer and and the the, the things that you use, the your keyboard and piano you use for for writing, and the knowledge that you've acquired over the years, but you have no contacts. No one knows who you are. How would you restart? Um, with no contacts at all. Well, um, uh, I remember this very well, and and I'm kind of in the same place uh, now with theatre. And I, um, uh, so you need material to, in order to show. And um, a friend of mine, the best advice I ever got was uh, a, a, my friend from university, who said, "On nine a.m. Monday morning, you're a composer, so you better get composing." And, um, so, uh, and I did, you know, and you start writing stuff with no reason other than you need stuff written. Um, so I would, uh, I would get busy creating material and, um, and I would be going to, um, uh, trying to network. Um, I'm not sure if the student parties would work in the same way, but, uh, but that I would be finding, um, you know, avenue, trying to find and figure out where, uh, my particular art form has a place in the world and who I need to speak to about that. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a book on, um, there's a book called the luck factor by, uh, I forget the name of the guy, but he's in, um, the university of Hertfordshire. And one of the key elements, one of the key traits of lucky people was their ability to be open to possibilities and network. And, um, so, uh, I think those are the, uh, the key ingredients, Awesome. And we'll put the link to the luck factor as well. I'll find out the, the details for that. So, Rolf, thank you so much for taking time today. I know you're, I'm sure, busy if you're about to go into writing for this next project. Thank you so much for coming on, sharing your your creative journey uh, as, a, as a film composer. And I wish you all the best in the future. And but before we finish up, share the best ways that listeners can connect with you and find out about all the different projects you've got going on. Uh, yes, well, the, the easiest way is via the website. So that's just rolfkent.com. And uh, you can connect to me through there. You can try and connect to me through Twitter as well. It's just Rolf Kent. Um, and, um, but yeah, the, um, the, the website is the, uh, the best portal because then you can also see what's going on, what music is. Um, uh, you can listen to some music and uh, you can also go from there to the Zen Effect. So uh, you can do all those things via rolfkent.com. Great. Thanks for coming on the show, Rolf. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high-performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.